It's my pleasure to introduce a friend and good colleague, Christine Stabel Ben, who hails from Denmark and has spent many years since 1993 in Guinea-Bissau, a very small country on the west coast of Africa, and has participated very actively together with a close colleague of her, Peter Abbey, in building the Bandim Health Project in Guinea-Bissau. And there's a website if any of you are interested, www.bandim.org. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ben, Ms. Double Ben, um, is, uh, she's, she postdoced at the Danish National Hospital um, and at Stanford University, and subsequently moved to uh, Denmark from Stanford, where she was selected by the Danish National Research Foundation to establish and lead a center of excellence, the Research Center for Vitamins and Vaccines. Um, she's a professor in global health at the University of Southern Denmark, and her research focuses on vaccines and what are often called the nonspecific or off-target effects of vaccines on the immune system. Um, and that is going to be the subject of her talk today. So, Christine, delighted that you can join us, and we look forward to hearing about your work. Over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this and for the opportunity to spend an afternoon in cold and windy Copenhagen in front of my computer enjoying interactions with other people about science. That's absolutely fantastic. I think this conference is a great idea. I think it's come to stay. I hope we'll see many more of them allowing people from all over the world to meet in, in this way. I'll be talking, as Eleanor introduced uh, to you, about vaccines and the nonspecific effects of vaccines. And I think most of us can relate to vaccines because almost everybody has been vaccinated many times. So even the poorest country will have a routine child vaccination program. And in the case of Guinea-Bissau, where I work, it uh, has consisted for many years of BCG at birth, uh, together with all polio vaccine followed by three doses of diphtheria, tetanus pertussis vaccine, or pentavalent vaccine, and oral polio vaccine at 6, 10, and 14 weeks of age, and then measles vaccine at nine months of age. These programs, this is the core of, of all programs. They can look different in different countries, and, and in high-income countries, additionally, now they're being added vaccines to older children, to elderly, and, and pregnant women are also now target for many vaccines. Um, the current definition of vaccines establishes that these vaccines are, consist of pathogens which introduce a specific memory in the host. Uh, and we distinguish between two types of vaccines, and that's going to be important for my presentation, so I'll dwell a little bit of, uh, on, on that, because there are the old vaccines uh, where it all started with the live attenuated vaccines, which are the pathogen in an, an attenuated form, which introduce a mild or subclinical disease. And these vaccines are actually really good at, at providing specific uh, protection. Most provide specific protection, lifelong protection already after one dose. Um, and examples of these vaccines are BCG vaccines, measles or measles mumps rubella vaccine, and all polio vaccine. And then we have the non-live vaccines, which contain the whole pathogen or parts of products of the pathogen in a non-live version. And these vaccines are typically not very good at inducing specific protection. So we usually give them in several doses. We give them together with an adjuvant to uh, tickle the immune system to, to respond to them. We often also need to give booster doses later on in life. And examples of these vaccines are diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, inactivated polio vaccine, a new RTSS malaria vaccine. And, and in fact, most of all the new vaccines are non-lab vaccines for many reasons, uh, most of them being, or the most important probably being, that they are easier to, to control production-wise and they don't create a disease in immunocompromised uh, hosts. Our main research idea is that vaccines, apart from their specific effects, also have important non-specific effects. So they introduce immunity against the target disease, but they also affect the way the host is susceptible to other infectious diseases subsequently. And we do propose that it's time to, uh, for, a, for a paradigm shift, uh, time to end what we have coined the specific solution paradigm, the idea that vaccines only produce uh, protection against the target disease. And instead, we strive to uh, establish what we have called a systemic effect paradigm, where in addition to their specific effects, Vaccines have these non-specific effects that we've called them in lack of a better word. Um, 
And they may be just as important as their specific effects, and they may also be beneficial in many cases, but very controversially uh, and problematic and worryingly, they may also sometimes be harmful. And to make it a little bit more specific, uh, I think what we propose is that according to the current paradigm, what takes place here is that the little boy is getting immunized against measles in the shoulder, the little girl is getting immunized against diphtheria tetanus pertussis in her thigh, but much more takes place um, in according, to, uh, according to what we think and suggest. Uh, we do think that the boy gets a protection against measles, but at the same time he also gets an immune system training lesson, um, which will enhance his ability to combat subsequent infections. Um, but problematically, the girl uh, gets immunity against diphtheria tetanus pertussis, but at the same time her immune system is taught something which will make it or misdirect it and make it less capable of combating subsequent infections. So you can see already now why this research is still very controversial uh, and, and also worrying. Of course, this proposition that vaccines have non-specific effect, it doesn't come out of the blue, but it's based on uh, almost 40 years of studies now at the Bandon Health Project, which is a health and demographic surveillance system platform based in the small West African country, Guinea-Bissau. Um, and there, our project follows more than 100,000 people in the urban study area in six suburbs there, and more than 100,000 people in 182 representative village clusters in the rural areas. Um, and this forms a platform for testing the real-life effects of health interventions. The backbone in our project is uh, the regular home visits, which are conducted by foot in the urban area, by car in the rural areas, and we go and visit all women in the fertile age and their children, and we ask about their whereabouts, if they're alive, if they've been ill, if they've been to hospital, which vaccines it got. And in addition, we have also established um, a registration of vaccinations at the health centers, which serves our community, and at the hospital, where they go and get hospitalized. So we have on the date uh, timing of the events when they occur, both for vaccines and for hospitalizations and for most deaths. So this really uh, gives us the opportunity to follow what happens in real life when new health interventions are introduced. Uh, we, we, we can see what happens when national campaigns are introduced. And we can also, on this backbone, build randomized controlled trials of different vaccination schedules, for instance. We've been there, as I said, for, for more than 40 years, or almost 40 years, and that allows us to draw some curves uh, on what happens during these years. And uh, here are some really good news for everybody who is interested in, in child health, because this is uh, the curve over under five mortality uh, occurring since 1979, when we started in, in Guinea-Bissau, and up to modern days. And you'll see that mortality has declined tremendously, almost unbelievably, during this period. Uh, but you will also see that this may not look like an exact learning curve because it doesn't just decline and decline. There are ups and there are downs. And I'm going to allude to that, uh, the potential explanations why, uh, during my presentation here. So what I'll propose and start out by proposing is that measles vaccine may have played a major role for the decline in overall mortality, much more than it has been appreciated so far. And you'll see from this curve uh, that actually the largest decline in, in child mortality occurs when measles vaccine was introduced in 79. But there have also been large reductions in mortality during the last 20 years when there have been measles vaccination campaigns to eliminate measles. Um, I'm going to show you just a very little bunch of studies that we have done on measles vaccine and also on the other vaccines. And it's regrettably due to lack of time because we have numerous studies. So you just have to believe me here that what I'm presenting, I just got a few examples, uh, but I can refer you to sources to, to get more information. But I want to start out with this example, which is really where everything starts, because that's when we introduced measles vaccine at the Bandam Health Project in urban Guinea-Bissau in 79. We published the data in 1984, and we've recently published it again using more advanced statistical methods. Uh, the results are basically the same. What happened when measles vaccine was introduced was that mortality dropped tremendously. The group that's vaccinated, and you can see that here on the curve, they have much lower mortality than the group that was not vaccinated. Um, and in fact, the difference was a 70% reduction in mortality among vaccinated versus unvaccinated children. Um, importantly, uh, measles was well known at the time. We had uh, all uh, information on what the children died from, and the non-vaccinated children just didn't die from measles infection. So this huge decline in mortality 
uh, in the vaccinated children was not explained from protection against measles infection. And in fact, also WHO uh, knew at that time uh, that, that measles infection, while it was a very contagious, very dangerous disease, still only accounted for around 10 to 15 percent of all death at that time. So, so you will see that the decline in mortality is much larger than we could have predicted from the specific pre preventive effect of measles vaccine against measles infection. So this first observation really kickstarted the agenda on non-specific effects because it suggested that measles vaccine gave not only protection against measles, but it also came with a bonus. It protected children against other infectious causes of uh, death. Uh, and in fact, I'll just show you here the, the um, the aggregated data, so this is all the studies that are available in the world of what happened when measles vaccine was introduced. Uh, it's before after studies from Bissau, the first one I showed you, it's two studies from Senegal, from Congo and from India. All these sites have had data to look at the annual mortality rate uh, before and after introduction of measles vaccine. And all of these studies uh, in agreement suggest that the mortality decline was at least 50% once measles vaccine was introduced. So again, I don't have time to, to show you all the data we have, but we've done numerous observational studies and also randomized controlled trials subsequently, and they all demonstrate that measles vaccine has tremendous effects on overall survival, which cannot be explained from the prevention of measles vaccine. So we do believe, uh, going back to the curve here, that the decline in mortality may actually be very correlated with the introduction of measles vaccine and also with the recent measles vaccine campaigns in Guinea-Bissau. Um, and there, uh, with respect to measles vaccine campaigns, we've actually seen that additional doses of measles vaccine have additional survival benefits. And as measles vaccine is actually quite protective already in one dose, again, it alludes to some nonspecific effects of measles vaccine um, to, to account for this data. But what I've also put on this graph here, a new vaccine is BCG, because that may also have played a role for the reduction in all-cause mortality, child mortality seen since, seen since uh, 79. And you will also see here again that BCG uh, introduction in 1984, uh, it correlates very well with a decline in overall mortality. Um, for BCG, we've been fortunate that we've been able to do some large randomized trials because in Guinea-Bissau, as in many other low-income countries, BCG is not given to low birth weight children at birth. So all children will receive BCG at birth except from those weighing below 2,500 grams who will typically be referred to come and get it uh, with the first pentavalent vaccine at six, months, uh, six weeks of age. So that gave us the opportunity to conduct randomized trials where the intervention group got BCG uh, at birth, like they would not normally do, um, but the, the control group uh, continued to get BCG uh, around six weeks of age. So you'll see that from, uh, from in the first month of life, we could actually compare in a completely unbiased fashion uh, in a randomized trial those who got BCG at birth versus those who hadn't yet gotten BCG at birth. So that allowed us to study the uh, overall mortality effect of BCG, a vaccine which, based on its specific effects, should have no effect on neonatal mortality because children don't die from tuberculosis in the first month of life. Uh, but really consistently, what we have found now in three trials, and we just reported that a few months ago in clinical infectious diseases, um, is that BCG is associated with strong reductions, very marked reductions in neonatal mortality. So we've done a total of three trials. The first trial, one was a small trial among very fragile children who came to the health center with low weight. And you'll see their mortality in the control group, the light gray bar here, is very high. Um, but in the group that received BCG when they came to the health center, mortality was 72% reduced. The two subsequent trials had lower control group mortality. And uh, accordingly, as what we could expect, the effect of BCG uh, is somewhat smaller because we only expect BCG to affect infectious disease mortality. And as overall mortality declines during the conduct of these three trials, uh, obviously a smaller and smaller proportion will be infectious diseases and a larger proportion, relatively speaking, will be things we cannot do something about like asphyxia, malformations, etc. Um, but still, you'll see that even with lower control group mortality in the latest trial we conducted and just finalized, BCG was associated with a 30% reduction in, in neonatal mortality. Again, this has nothing to do with prevention of tuberculosis. This is a purely nonspecific effect. And when we looked into the causes of death, what BCG seemed to prevent was respiratory infections and septicemia. Um, 
So we did a combined analysis, and in the uh, neonatal period, BCG was associated with a strongly significant 38% reduction in neonatal mortality. And this is really, really important from a public health point of view, because while child mortality has been declining throughout all low-income countries in the last decades, what has been really hard to, to, to get to is neonatal mortality. It's quite referatory towards um, uh, uh, all the different interventions. We don't have any good interventions against neonatal mortality yet, but what this data suggests is that BCG may actually be some, something like a golden bullet against neonatal mortality. And very intriguingly, the effect occurs quite rapidly because you'll see that already after three days, there was a 45% reduction in mortality. I'll come back to why that, why, why that may be uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, oral polio vaccine, and here I'm talking about the third live attenuated vaccine, so measles vaccine, BCD, both live attenuated, so is oral polio vaccine. Well, that may also have played a role for the decline in mortality. And again, the many no OPV campaigns that we've had during the last decade coincide with the reduction in child mortality we see here. But we also, like for the other vaccines, have done loads of individual-based studies. And I'm going to present just one result here that was just uh, accepted for publication. Um, here we have looked at all the children in our Bandem study area from 2002 to 2014 and looked at uh, mortality before and after uh, each campaign using a child as its own control uh, and, and controlling for age, obviously. And you can almost uh, eyeball this curve and see that, that you know, the large reductions in mortality during this period seem to coincide with the campaigns while there is no great effect when there are no campaigns. And if we put all this into the analysis, again, correcting for age, et cetera, then we see that OPV campaigns, each of these campaigns was associated with a 19% significant reduction in mortality. Importantly, if we try to, try to simulate all kinds of different dates for campaigns, we didn't find any effect. If we looked at the effect of vitamin A campaigns, which were also conducted this time, there was no effect. So this um, effect of OPV campaign doesn't seem to be an analytical artifact, and if, uh, it doesn't seem to be an effect of just have, having a, a campaign, no matter which campaign. We truly believe that this is related to all polio vaccines' beneficial non-specific effects. And also, we found it extra convincing that each additional dose of OPV conferred additional benefit in terms of the 13% additional reduction in mortality. So this data is, is on its way and hopefully soon published. Uh, it's extremely important from the point of view that all polio vaccine is going to be stopped in 2020. So if this vaccine actually has these beneficial effects, well, what may happen is that we may see child mortality start to increase again once OPV is stopped. And obviously, we think it's extremely important to conduct more research before that happens. So in conclusion, what I've said in this first part of my presentation is that we've had some marvelous reductions in child mortality in Guinea-Bissau during the last 40 years. And we will argue that the introduction of the live attenuated vaccines may explain a large part of this decline. Um, I've argued from the look of the curve, this ecological perspective, but that's obviously not the most important argument. The most important argument is uh, the large number of studies that we've done, individual-based large number of studies we've done on um, observational studies, randomized studies, uh, comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated va individuals uh, for these uh, three vaccines. So we have many, many studies to, to back this uh, postulate. Anyway, I'll move on here uh, from the good news um, to the bad news, because as I hinted to in the beginning of my presentations, we also have peaks in mortality, um, which occur in between all these reductions in mortality. And we have some very good explanations for some of the peaks. So for instance, in, in 1998, Guinea-Bissau had a civil war, and you'll see that the mortality increased during this period. Um, we also, um, however, think that vaccines may play a role. And, and here we have just recently published a study uh, based on historical data. So our project introduced DTP and oral polio vaccine in Bissau in 1981. Uh, this was done as a service to the community in connection with some uh, nutritional examinations. So we had nutritional examinations every three months. Uh, and as a service, we provided DTP and oral polio vaccine to all children above three months of age. So we have here on the upper uh, graph all the children. One dot is a child here who got DTP. And here we have the children who got oral polio vaccine. Um, 
here we have their ages and here we have the, uh, the, the year they got the vaccine. And you'll see that there was quite a huge variation in how children were vaccinated because there were periods without DTP, periods without old polio vaccine. Um, so that provided us an opportunity to look at what had happened uh, when the vaccines were introduced and the separate effects of DTP and old polio vaccine. And uh, the data was originally only on some yellow A5 cards, so we didn't have them digitalized before a few years ago. Um, we never thought anything when we introduced the vaccines other than they would be beneficial and the community would benefit from these vaccines. Uh, but, but let me show you what really happened when we started to digitalize the data and we got them analyzed from the perspective of, of the vaccine effect on mortality. One thing I just want to stress here is that this is the best type of study you can have apart from a randomized trial because it was really quite random which vaccines children got and also because the nutritional visits were every three months it was um, quite random and, and children were only vaccinated from the age of three months. Some children could be three months and two days, other children could be five months and 28 days when they got the vaccine. So we could really compare very unbiased children who were vaccinated with those who weren't vaccinated in terms of their mortality. And I have the results here and they are indeed very uh, worrying because here we compare the risk of dying between children who receive DTP only uh, versus no DTP. And you will see here that in urban Bissau, and that's uh, the data I just showed you, when we analyzed the old data from the A5 cards, DCP actually was associated with tenfold higher mortality than not getting DCP. And this corroborated the findings from a study we had done already uh, earlier on and published in 2004 from rural Guinea-Bissau. Here, DTP only was associated with a fivefold uh, non-significant higher mortality. But if you do a combined analysis of both these uh, studies, uh, then DTP is associated with an eightfold higher mortality. Um, noteworthy, these two are the only studies that have ever been done on the overall mortality effect of DTP vaccines. So there's no study to contradict that this may actually have been the net result of introducing DTP. So DTP protected against diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis, but it also seemed to have interfered with the children's immune system. It also seemed to have increased the risk of getting subsequent infections and dying from these infections. Intriguingly, this is completely sex differential. So if we look at female male mortality among measles vaccinated and DTP vaccinated children, then you'll see that among measles vaccinated children, the female male mortality ratio is consistently below one, indicating that females have lower mortality than males. But if we go to children who are DTP vaccinated, the picture is completely opposite. And that's also what we see in all the individual studies looking at vaccinated versus unvaccinated children. The added or increased mortality after DTP is limited to the females. So it really seems to be the females who cannot cope with the DTP vaccines. Well, I'll get back to that uh, and why that could be later on. But um, I'll just sum up this part of the conclusion by saying that actually looking again from the ecological perspective, uh, the introduction of both DTP and DTP booster actually coincide with increases in mortality on this curve. So to summarize our epidemiological findings and what we do believe is the case at this time, and I've, I've deliberately put the date here because this is a moving target, it may look different in, in February, but what we do see do you believe we can say with some confidence at this time point is that we have found six principles which seem to be valid and reproducible and they are that the live vaccines and here I've shown you data on measles vaccine, BCG and all polio vaccine but we have similar data from smallpox vaccine have beneficial non-specific effects uh, and, and uh, reduce mortality more than can be ascribed to the specific effects whereas the non-live vaccines I've shown you data on DCP but we have similar data on Hep B, Penta malaria vaccine, H1N1 and IPV have harmful non-specific effects um, and, and they are particularly marked for females. The fourth principle uh, and fifth and sixth I haven't had much time to, to talk to you about but, but um, well we might get back to that uh, during the chat. Um, but, but, but very briefly we see these effects are strongest for the most recent vaccine and we also see that for the live vaccines it seems to be beneficial to be vaccinated in the presence of maternal immunity and it seems to be beneficial to have boosted doses like I alluded to previously. 
this is controversial. This contradicts what we know about vaccines, what we think we know about vaccines. So I'm going to speak just a little bit about the political aspects because obviously this has created a lot of debate. And in 2013, the WHO decided to conduct a review of the evidence for nonspecific effects of vaccines. And the results were published in 2016, a little bit more than a year ago. And uh, the review looked at BCG, DTP, and measles containing vaccine. And uh, it reached the same conclusions like I've presented here, that receipt of BCG and measles containing vaccines may reduce overall mortality more than expected through their effects on the disease they prevent. In contrast, DTP may be associated with higher all-cause mortality. So there is now a more general acceptance of these phenomena. And also recently, um, some otherwise quite skeptic immunologists uh, published a paper where they also uh, acknowledged that uh, non-specific effects of vaccines are indeed plausible. So let me take you just by the end of my talk briefly through the potential immunological mechanisms. And here I'll also refer you to a review I wrote in 2013 together with some really great colleagues where we looked at, at two potential explanations, namely heterologous T-cell immunity or trained innate immunity. With regard to heterologist T-cell immunity, the, that's really work done by, by fantastic colleagues, uh, Celine and Wells at Massachusetts. They have been uh, groundbreaking in showing that infection history significantly impacts the response to subsequent challenges. And this may be beneficial, but sometimes also harmful. And they also show very neatly that this takes place through activation of T-cell memory um, cells through cross-reactive uh, epitopes. So, I'll ask the question to myself, can heterologous immunity explain nonspecific effects? And well, yes, it sort of uh, serves as a proof of principle that vaccines could alter the immune response to subsequent unrelated infections. And it may be beneficial, like in the case of measles and BCG vaccine, but also harmful in the case of DTP vaccine. Um, what's interesting about Wells and Celine's work is that they show that even very different pathogens will share cross-reactive epitopes. So this cross-reactivity can take place between to very dissimilar viruses or a virus and a bacteria. bacteria. So, so, so really it lends some support to the idea that the meeting with one pathogen can significantly alter the response to a very different pathogen. Uh, one problem with heterologous immunity is that it takes place through the adaptive immune system, so it will probably take months or weeks at least to develop. So it wouldn't go along uh, in terms of explaining why we see these very rapidly occurring effects of BCG vaccine. But there we have looked towards trained innate immunity. Uh, the real groundbreaker here is Mihaly Tia uh, from Radboud University, who has shown that the innate immune system, in contrast to everything we believe, actually has a potential to develop memory. And it didn't come as a shock for many people, because if you talk with insect people and plant people, they know that 95% of all species only have uh, an innate immune system, and actually they cope quite well without an adaptive immune system, and they can develop memory, and they can even transfer it transgenerationally. So the immune system, the trained, uh, or the innate immune system may actually be much smarter uh, and much more clever than it has been anticipated so far. So the reason why we got in contact with Nitea was his work on BCG vaccine and trained innate immunity. He vaccinated volunteers with BCG and took blood two weeks and three months after and found that BCG was associated with increases in in vitro pro-inflammatory cytokine responses, um, both to mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, which is not surprising, but also to staphylococcus and candida albicans. Um, so a nonspecific uh, activation by BCG. And what he showed was that this took place through epigenetic modifications in the monocytes, and they were seen uh, still after three months after vaccination, so really some quite long-lasting uh, effects which weren't just bystander effect. Um, and we, we were so intrigued by this finding, so we took it to Guinea-Bissau to one of our randomized trials, and we could see exactly the same. So just like in the Dutch volunteers, the Guinean babies who participated in the randomized trial and got BCG had increased nonspecific innate responsiveness. So this really points as, uh, at, at BCG as a potential uh, non-specific immune modulant, which could uh, enhance the immune system of Guinean babies and make them survive better. We were, of course, interested in whether we could demonstrate the impact of BCG in a model of human infection, and we published that just two weeks ago in, in cell, host, and microbes. Um, and, and this was a nice study done by the Dutch, where they gave BCG or placebo to volunteers, and then four weeks later, a yellow fever vaccine 
And the yellow fever vaccine is quite a strong vaccine and uh, it does create uh, viremia on day five. And what the Dutch could show very neatly was that those who had received uh, BCG had significantly reduced yellow fever viremia five days after vaccination. So this serves as the first post of uh, proof of principle study that BCG can alter the course of an unrelated uh, infection uh, in, in, in vivo. Uh, so very, uh, for us, intriguing and important new findings, which lend a lot of support to the concept that BCG has important nonspecific effects. We also have looked more generally into other live vaccines and non-live vaccines with the Dutch and what comes out so far, and this is still limited uh, data, it's still very much a bit preliminary, but what I will share with you today is that we see some patterns which corroborate what we see uh, epidemiologically speaking, that live vaccines seem to induce trained innate immunity, but the non-live vaccines induce innate tolerance. Uh, so that points to some quite fundamental differences. I acknowledge that live vaccines are very um, uh, they're very heterogeneous, they're, they're not very similar, and, and non-live vaccines, it's not like they're just one entity, but still uh, there seem to be some general features about live on one side, non-live on another side, uh, which are important for the immune system and, and how they affect the immune system of the host. So can trained innate immunity explain non-specific effects? Well, I think it goes quite a long way. It will explain how vaccines could alter the immune response to subsequent infections, how that could be beneficial, but also sometimes detrimental. And, and it could also go a long way to explain how vaccines like BCG could have effects already within a few days. Um, so so uh, in conclusion, I do think that there are some immunological mechanisms here which lend support to the idea that vaccines can have important nonspecific effects. Just a few words on sex differences. Uh, I showed you the graphs for measles vaccine and DTP and how they had completely different effects in males and females. And there are a number of reasons for that, which were uh, summarized very neatly by Katie Flanagan, who spoke yesterday uh, in a review from Vaccine 2011. And I'll refer you to that if you're interested in these aspects. But uh, just to show you one uh, uh, paper here from Katie and her PhD student and other people who looked into the sex differential non-vaccine uh, specific immunological effects of DTP and measles vaccine. They have a beautiful paper. There are lots and lots of graphs and illustrations and I've only time to show you one, uh, but I think it is a very important one because it shows the transcriptome networks established after DTP vaccine in females and males respectively. And you'll see that they are completely different uh, and you'll also see uh, that, that or note that no networks could be generated unless groups were separated by sex. So I think here we look at some very fundamental differences between boys and girls. We still don't know the reasons why they respond so differently to vaccines, but we could definitely see here that they do respond very differently, and that could be very important in terms of their very different mortality response to these vaccines. So I'll just end up by summarizing these principles of the systemic effect paradigm that we have so far and then with some questions for you. And I know there are a lot of young people sitting out here listening to this. Uh, these are definitely thought for you because you have the young and sort of unbiased minds and you are the ones I truly believe could help us answer questions like why are there differences between live and non-live vaccines? Why are there differences between the sexes? And we also look more and more into transgenerational effects and the priming boosting with live vaccines. All these issues need to be solved for us to be wiser and ultimately to use the vaccines we have even wiser than we do already. So with that, I want to thank all the people who have participated in the 40 years of work that I've tried to squeeze into 30 minutes here. And of course, also our, uh, our funders. And I'll thank the audience out there in cyberspace for listening. Dr. Sabal Ben for that incredible talk. Uh, we do have quite a few questions from the audience and I think the topic of vaccines really generates a lot of discussion out there. So we'll start with a question which asks, what will happen when MV has been withdrawn from the vaccination schedule and are there thoughts on the effects, on non-specific effects that may occur? Um, a very good question. I don't know if and when measles vaccine will be withdrawn, we are still fighting to eliminate uh, measles. And the big question is, once measles has been uh, eradicated, whether 
one would dare to stop measles vaccine completely. And here I also think from a bioterror perspective, there could be issues uh, uh, where people would want to continue with some kind of basic immunization against measles. So I'm not sure measles vaccine will be stopped, but I would be very concerned about stopping measles vaccine. That's for sure. Uh, I'm, Definitely, once measles is eradicated, the, the intensity of measles vaccine will go down probably, uh, the campaigns will stop. Uh, I think based on all we know, based on all the data available, this will have negative consequences for child health. Okay, and we also have a question about the DCP vaccine. Um, does the age at which it's administered change mortality rates at all? Um, it's a very good question. We have um, not so much data on that because DTP is recommended at 6, 10 and 14 weeks of age and, and uh, while children do get it with delay, it's not like we have a lot of data on older children uh, and, and so on. Um, I, 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 uh, we have seen negative effects also uh, on DTP booster vaccine given at 18 months of age, so the negative effects are not limited to the infants but are also seen in slightly older children, uh, whether they are more generalizable, uh, I cannot answer because there simply isn't really data to, to support either or. We have another question from Semen about mortality rates, and I think this is really important given, you know, some of the debates about whether vaccines are necessary or not. Um, for this, um, Semen is asking, there are usually inclusion or exclusion criteria for each vaccine. So as you mentioned, immunosuppressed individuals are not able to receive certain vaccines. Um, does that, some of the mortality measures in these studies, is that kind of considering those facts, the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Yeah, um, so, so there are no uh, children in Guinea-Bissau, there's no setup to actually detect immunocompromised children. So all children are vaccinated. Uh, if, if, uh, if there's anything that uh, um, uh, happens, there will be a bias towards vaccinating the most healthy children. Uh, so if you ask any African mother, she'll be a little reluctant to, buy, uh, to bring her ill child um, for vaccination. So we know that there is in all our observational studies an, an inherent bias towards a benefit for the vaccinated because it is the healthy children who are vaccinated. Uh, so that could go some way to explain the benefits we see of BCG and measles vaccine in our observational studies where we merely compare those who come for the vaccine with those who didn't come for the vaccine. Uh, but, but fortunately we've been able to do randomized trials on both these vaccines and the randomized comparisons where we have all the included children getting either or uh, either vaccine uh, early or delayed, there we see the same benefits as we see in the observational studies. So the findings from observational studies were corroborated in randomized trial trials. Um, for DTP, we have not been able to do randomized trials, but what we think is very convincing is that in the case of DTP, the non-specific effects we see are in disfavor of the vaccinated children. So in spite of the healthy vaccine bias, these children have higher mortality. And the effect of DTP is highly significantly different from the effect of BCG and measles vaccine. So that really points to some fundamental differences in the two uh, types of vaccines, um, which cannot be explained by any known bias. Um, okay, and on that note, do you have any comments with respect to the effect of maternal antibodies in these children? Yeah, well, I didn't have time to really come into that, but what we have seen so far is that, um, well, according to the current understanding, vaccines should be postponed until you're rid of the maternal antibodies because that could inf interfere with the specific protection. And we definitely see that if we give vaccines early in the presence of maternal antibodies, the children will have somewhat lower antibody levels. But it's really noteworthy that while we really strive for the high antibody levels, there's been no study ever showing that high antibody levels in themselves were beneficial in terms of overall mortality. And what's even more noteworthy is that if you look at the overall mortality effect, all the studies which have provided measles vaccine early in the earlier rather than later have stronger mortality effects uh, unrelated to measles infection. Um, and, and also we have two specific studies where we actually have antibody measurements at the time of vaccination and those who do best in terms of survival are those who are vaccinated in the presence of maternal antibodies. 
So, so contradicting all we think we know about how vaccines should be given later to avoid maternal antibodies from a non-specific effects of vaccine perspective, it's actually better uh, to give the vaccines in the presence of maternal antibodies. And we know that there are different uh, effects of maternal antibodies on uptake of the vaccine antigen, which could go a long way to explain that. So you have more optimization, different intake of the antigen antibody complex into the macrophages and so on. Um, if you vaccinate in the presence of maternal immunity, uh, maternal antibodies, and we do think this is uh, extremely important, actually may turn out to be extremely important and something we are very keen to look more into in the coming years. Very exciting work and we're hoping to hear more from you in the near future. So on behalf of the Global BSI Committee, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you for attending. We do have some questions that may not have been addressed and they're in the chat box, so if you could just take a look and address them. That would be incredible. I'll do that. So thank you. <laughs>